Glowing Fish and Designer Babies. This is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew. Okay, so today's episode is about genetic engineering. So you can kind of think of it as like choosing your own person or animal or organism or anything. I I mean, the the, com- the techniques have gotten more complex over time, but essentially it's just modifying someone's genome, their, their DNA, what makes them them. And this is not just restricted to people, it's also bacteria and animals and plants. And here we're, we're addressing uh, sort of the history of genetic engineering, and we're going to go into the implications of a relatively semi-new technique that's recently been refined. Hopefully we can sort of give a prognosis of what's to come, I think. Yeah, well, you know, neither of us are experts in genetic engineering. Yes. Keep that in mind. That will be very clear. But... We have done a little bit of research. Um, Matthew's done more research than I have, so... Perhaps. I'll be a little bit less informed, but still useful. You could imagine the first organisms that were genetically modified were bacteria. And I think one of the first commercial applications of genetically modifying bacteria was essentially to keep plants uh, from developing frost. So it's all been about increasing crop yield, I think, especially since the since the time that genetic modification has been developed. That's really been its main commercial application. And right now, uh, what we're... What we're talking about right now uh, is the big, the big sort of GMO is what we're talking about, modified crops. Yes, GMO stands for genetically modified organism, which and doesn't just mean food, by the way. For all you activists out there, it also means uh, creatures, humans, anything that is an organism genetically modified. So actually, I was I was going to start talking about genetic engineering. Actually, so bacteria getting DNA inserted from uh, other organisms, which is called. Yeah transgenic genetic engineering but actually genetic modification has been occurring uh since humans really started domesticating animals uh yeah uh, it's in a process called uh, selective breeding where uh you basically pick the thing with the most desirable quality and breed it with other things of desirable quality and slowly you're going to modify the genetics of an organism to your specific tastes we did it with dogs um, we've done it with a lot of domesticated animals. Um, we've done it with pretty much all of our crops. Most organisms we see uh, in the modern day have probably been genetically modified by humans at some point. But what we're talking about right now is fast genetic modification. Yeah, every species has evolved through a process of genetic modification. Because the the way that species evolve is through natural selection, and essentially organisms that are better adapted to their environment are able to pass on their genes. And so genetic modification in a human sense is that humans get to decide which organisms spread on their genes. But the difference right. between this and genetic engineering is just like what Tyler said. It's the speed at which we can modify these organisms. And some people are a little scared by the speed of this, as we'll go into later. But right now, I think... Uh, do we want to touch on the history? Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, the first the first commercial application that was released into the public of a genetically modified organism was the organism Ice Minus. Its name implies what it did. It made it so that ice wouldn't form on plants. And it's kind of interesting because the yeah. first time that Ice Minus was released <laughs> into uh, the wild, or I think it wasn't even the wild, I think it was just a group of plants that they decided to release it on in, in somebody's uh, backyard, maybe a research lab or whatever. It, the first time they did it, it was attacked by a group of protesters. Yeah, so they... that kind of exemplifies just how contentious the issue has been, really. Because the first time that a genetically modified organism was released into the environment, it was already being attacked by protesters. You could just imagine how how much more contentious and controversial it's gotten since then. And uh, this protest, by the way, was at the University of California, Berkeley. So we're, we're talking about a protest. People didn't trust uh, the scientists at Berkeley to be creating genetically modified material. So, But genetic modification has advanced a lot since then. We're not just uh, editing 
bacteria now. A few years after that, we genetically modified um, the first uh, GMO mouse, which uh, sort of led into other things like glowfish and... Uh, <laughs> Well, I, th I think even before that, we genetically modified a tomato plant, and that was That's the true. first commercial application. I think they uh, one of the things is that uh, they they really want to in increase crop yield, and that's mainly the purpose of genetic modification. That's been the sort of plot line of genetic engineering so far. People are always wanting wanting to increase their uh, uh, crop yield. Crop yield. I almost said plot yield, but that's totally wrong. <laughs> I guess you could say plot yield, though. It's yeah, in a plot, I mean, and it's yeah, the yield it's, in it's the plot. The yield in their plot of land. <laughs> okay. Anyways, but genetic modification is taking on a new face, and I this this movie was released uh, over a decade ago. I think it was mm -hmm. 1999. But Gattaca is a popular movie that is it's kind of a dystopian future where they examine the implications of genetic modification of humans. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it was big. A lot of people saw it, and it still to this day drives a lot of the talk, at least public discourse, about the future of genetic engineering and where we should take it. For generations, and even, even maybe centuries since uh, Charles Darwin... There's been uh, th there's been something called eugenics. If we can modify the genetics of animals, say dogs or uh, cats, or m even if we can genetically modify plants using artificial selection, then surely we could do the same about humans. Yeah, and it's and traditionally uh, eugenics has been talked about by uh, some less than uh, ethical means, such as uh, genocide or. Uh, for example, preventing certain groups of people from breeding at all. And all of that, people were thinking, well, obviously you can't genocide a bunch of people just because they seem to have inferior genetics. And you're also not allowed to say you're not allowed to have babies because of your genetics. But... Well, it all encompasses the theory of social Darwinism. And it's yeah. essentially that the that the process of Darwinism in the natural world should also play a place in our natural world, the place where we live and inhabit. And it fuels, I mean, it fuels many discussions and acts of, of racism. That was one of the main uh, key features behind something called scientific racism, where people believed that their race was in superior to another race. And the reason why they can justify that is because that other race can die out, obviously due to genocides or whatever. So they must be the superior race. Obviously, all that stuff, probably not the best way to move society forward. But, with human genetic engineering, we now have a new avenue of eugenics where you could make the argument that we can have a perfect, a genetically perfect human race uh, without any genocides or without <laughs> any uh, restricting of people's rights if you just have everyone genetically modify their babies to be perfect. That's well, also I, raised some ethical dilemmas. If I could say the the main difference between this type of social Darwinism and the social Darwinism of, of past eugenics, essentially artificial selection of humans, is that in order to have artificial selection of humans, you have to have the weak die out and the strong live. But if you genetically engineer people, they can be strong without having weak people die out. So that's essentially one of the main arguments for people that say, yes, this is the new form of eugenics and it has advantages over the old. But there's still some ethical implications, which it doesn't make sense to just dismiss offhandedly. All right. And uh, I'm going to mention the big, big controversy in genetic engineering right now. There's GMOs, you know, that, and, and that's, that's had some repercussions with uh, environmentalists and just people who believe that nature should be, you know, natural, all that sort of thing. But this, this specific problem has implications throughout the whole genetic modification scientific community. And I'm talking about designer babies and whether they're ethical at all, what circumstances they're ethical in, or if we should just let genetic babies roam free, and just let people genetically engineer their babies however they'd like. So to explain, yes, essentially designer babies, the concept is that people in the future will be able to go into doctor's offices 
and tell their doctors, this is how I want my baby to look. And this, these are the features that I want my baby to have. And so they can name any, any list of features. They can choose their hair color, their eye color, their height, their intelligence, their, uh, uh how much muscle strength they'll have essentially, how long they'll get to live, how, uh, and all of these features, which of course any reasonable parent will choose the best features of all of them. And right. that, that will create a race of people that are born, especially among the wealthy, if it's the current system we have yeah. right now, <laughs> that, that will create a, a bunch of wealthy kids who, who will be genetically superior to the rest, which of yeah. course is, is just a feedback they, loop they, because, because then yeah. they'll be able to become even more wealthy. There's already class struggle right now. Picture if, the upper class could literally say they're genetically inferior to us scientifically. That would be terrible. Picture if a ruling upper class could literally say, yeah, no, they're lower human beings. Like, that is a terrible path for humanity to take. We're already not very nice to each other, and uh, considering uh, an extra added little ounce of they're literally scientifically worse than us, that is a bad idea. And you may be thinking... Ah, uh, you know, this is 20, 30 years off. Uh, there's actually been some very significant recent advances in genetic engineering. Yeah, so you might have heard in, in the news recently that we've recently developed tools that makes genetic modification yeah. easier. New and thing called CRISPR. It, well, specifically CRISPR CAS9. And it essentially allows us to e more easily modify any specific part of the genome. Before so, genetic uh, modification was a little bit, you know, you had, you had to target specific genomes that were easily targetable or you had to target groups, things like that. This mean, this makes a specific targeting of pretty much any genome, um, and it does it much cheaper. Than has been accomplished before. This is a huge leap forward for genetic engineering, which makes this a perfect time to talk about what the implications of human genetic engineering will be. And it's kind of accelerating process, uh, uh, progress, I think, because once you've developed this technology, then the scientists will realize there's a huge potential now that we have this specific thing. And so I, I personally would not be surprised if we could if we would have the designer baby debate publicly and everyone be talking about it within a decade or two. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, there have been a couple of recent summits about designer babies. Yes, but it's not really on the public mind yet. That's true. I think most people haven't thought about it beyond maybe the movie Gattaca because that has, <laughs> that has been a large, uh, that has been a large feature of public discourse, I think. Yep. Yeah. Gattaca, Gattaca drives it all. So actually, let's talk about. Um, let's talk about the system that's present in Gattaca. In Gattaca, we see pretty much every human has, um, has, is genetically engineered. Well, and not every single one, just the non-invalids. <coughs> yeah, the non, the non-invalids, which, I mean, you, I mean, if you, if you want to talk about it, you can, you can. Go yeah, ahead. sure. So the, the protagonist, he grows up in a world where he's an invalid and he has to compete with all these people who are genetically modified. And it gets to the point where uh, genetic discrimination is outlawed by law, right? I, I mean, it's it's in the law books that you cannot discriminate anyone who has a different genetic code. So they've codified it, they've they've made it law, but no employer in the entire country or even world, I think, and it follows the law. And so, yeah, which so isn't uncommon today, to be honest. Es essentially, there's such a there's such a gap between the genetically modified and the invalids that they don't even require a they don't require any interview when you want to get a job. They simply take a genetic sample of yours, find out whether you've been genetically modified, and if you are, then you have the job. And it makes it so that the people who are already uh, already low in rights and di disenfranchised, I I could say, people who are invalids and poor. It brings them to a whole new level because there is no hope. There, there's no such thing as equal opportunity. They yeah. are told from birth and throughout their entire life that there's nothing they can make of themselves. And the, the whole point of Gattaca is this, this person, I don't want to spoil it for you, but the main character who is an invalid has to go through all this crazy stuff to end up in a position where he can control his life. So the, the idea of Gattaca is, 
even if you let everyone genetically engineer and everyone has access to it, there's going to be people who want to have natural births, and those parents will definitely cripple their child's ability to function in a genetically modified society because they will be genetically inferior. Any problems they have else who is genetically modified. And that kind of addresses one of the problems that people bring up. Because a lot of times when people talk about genetic engineering, they say, oh, well, as long as there's equal access to it, then it would be a great thing because humanity would improve. But it doesn't really cover the type of people that want to see natural births. Yeah. And you and you might just dismiss them and say that eventually society would get over it. But I I mean, I think That's... if you did a poll currently, I think most people probably wouldn't genetically modify their yeah, babies. But here here's here's the thing. We don't need to take uh we don't need to take all these hypotheticals. There's already a parallel today. Vaccinations have been in play since how long ago? I mean, there was the influenza vaccine, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I think I think the first vaccine that was developed was the smallpox vaccine. Yeah, smallpox. And yeah, and I mean, vaccinations have been around for a long time, and people today are starting to have an anti-vaccination movement, which you know isn't the topic of this, but it's a direct parallel to people not wanting to genetically modify their babies. People not wanting to vaccinate is sort of a similar parallel. People who want to sort of have things done as as nature intended, as their words would probably be. And it it's, is a pretty good parallel because against all scientific evidence, well, virtually all scientific ev evidence, and against pop popular opinion, and against everyone telling them that they're making the wrong choice for their child, they continually do it, and they have their own culture that yeah. reinforces their belief. So I, so I, I would think, not be surprised at all if people had the same fact, attitude for genetic engineering. I would expect the same attitude for genetic engineering. So now... The problem lies in we have a potential future for humanity, which leaves humanity in this state of be everyone being at the absolute peak of their ability because they've been genetically modified to be perfect. But we also, in that same sort of utopic future, we have a very real and, in fact, extremely possible... Um, split where there's just an upper class of genetically modified perfect people and a lower class of regular old folks whose parents decided to birth them the natural way who are completely inferior to their genetically, to their basically genetically superpowered uh, peers. It's, I mean, it's, it's clearly a huge issue because it's literally about you could have either this utopic sort of perfect human human society or you could have the biggest class divide we've ever seen in the history of humanity some people some people point out that okay well then we should just ban it outright but i don't i don't really think that's that great of a solution mm -hmm. because there are avenues in which it's it's hard to argue in which we shouldn't genetically modify people. For example, people with genetic diseases. Huntington's disease, Tay-Sachs yeah. disease. Any These are heritable diseases that you can get from your parent. And I think... It doesn't make any sense that if we develop a technology to stop these, there should be a responsible discussion between a doctor and a parent, and the doctor should recommend the discussion. I mean, I mean, not just can, rec sorry, yeah. not just recommend the discussion, recommend the treatment. Yeah, and if you can stop someone from having a genetic disease, if you can stop someone from having an inheritable genetic disease, that is also a tough ethical question to say no to entirely. So a complete ban on genetic engineering also has its ethical problems. And I hate the slippery slope argument, because people will say, oh, well, then it's just a slippery slope between Huntington's yeah, disease and eye color. They'll say that for anything. Which, but in this example, I actually do see a slippery slope. No, oh, absolutely. Because there, once you've gotten rid of the genetic diseases, then every genetic defect after that will be seen as a disease. Uh, for example, being growing up to be weak, you could say that's just a genetic disease. You could say that growing up to have bad eyesight, of course, is a genetic disease. And once it gets, once it gets to the point in which everything that's kind of bad has already been solved, then everything that's even slightly bad have, I mean, if, if the hair color is not in style, you could say that's a genetic yeah. disease. It's, it, I mean, it's clearly a slippery slope, but also we really don't want people to be 
born into genetic disease when we can cure it. That's terrible. But uh, we have to go to commercials. And after the break, we are going to talk about the other side of the extreme. If we force children to be genetically modified. All right, we'll be right back after the commercials. Should parents be forced to genetically engineer their children? Welcome back to What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew. So the whole point is that if you genetically engineer your children, they're obviously better than the rest. Yeah. And the, the, assuming there's a high success rate with that, there really are no downsides to genetically engineering your children. Yep. Because in one scenario, if you just have children naturally, you're basically letting the lottery decide what your children will look like. And in the other example, you're you're choosing it yourself. Now, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd I'd rather have I'd rather have things under my control. I don't want to I don't want my life or anyone else's life controlled by a coin flip. Yeah, absolutely. So there's obviously no downside. But as we discussed before the break, there's going to be a culture of people, and you need to expect that there's a culture of people who will resist this. Yeah, it's almost a guarantee. So the question is, do you just say? All right, you guys, you'll come around later. Let's make this law. <laughs> Basically, do you which, just which that's... sort of ignore those people and say, let's genetically modify all our babies and you guys have to do it too? Uh, although, could you just <laughs> imagine the backlash on this? Mm -hmm. There would be protests everywhere. And even people who genetically modified their children would probably hate this law because yeah. it violates every, every idea we have of freedom. But there is one group of people that would probably be in support of this. And this is, these, these people are called transhumanists. Yeah. And I haven't heard of this before either. So can you explain this to both me and the audience? Well, before I explain transhumanism, I have to explain humanism. So humanism, not the Renaissance variety, but yeah. just <laughs> humanism is a branch of ethical philosophy that emphasizes the rights and values and uh, essentially the identity of the human being. And it says that human beings have a right to exist on the planet. They have a right to uh, not be annihilated, and they are more important than any other endeavor even in the universe. So that's essentially what tr humanism says. Yeah, don't confuse it with Renaissance humanism. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> so one thing is that transhumanism takes it to a whole different level. It says that if humans are important now, that is only because we are more intelligent than the animals. That's only because we have risen, abo risen above it. So if we have an opportunity to rise above what we are currently at using these advanced technologies, in this example, it's genetic modification, but transhumanists even take it a step further, which we might talk about in a different episode. They mm -hmm. want to upload their minds into computers. Yeah, that brings up an interesting argument about... AI and uh, intelligence in general, but that's for another topic. Let's keep going here. Of course. Well, transhumanists see it as not only just something that should happen, but an imperative that human beings create this technology and improve themselves, mm -hmm. because that that will create more value for the human race. And to them, at this point, if you can get to the point where genetic engineering is so advanced, we would become beyond humans. You could not only genetically engineer yourself to have different traits but still look like a human, you could genetically engineer yourself to not even look like a human and be far superior than anything that humans could ever imagine at the current state. Yeah. And uh, just to give uh, an idea of how powerful genetic engineering can be. You can give people the sort of brain Einstein had just to give an idea of how powerful genetic well, engineering is. Well, I can definitely take it a, a step further than this. And this is something that I borrowed from Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's a Ooh. physicist. Yeah. He was talking about genetic engineering. He was, he was emphasizing the power and potential of it. And so he brought up the examples... Humans are the king of the ecosystems. We rule over Earth because of our technology and superior intelligence. And that, it, the apes do not. The chimpanzees do not. And they are, they are 2% genetically different than us. 2% of their genetics are different. And yet they 
do not rule the earth and we do. If we can create a human that's 2% different than us in the other direction, then imagine what type of power those new humans would be able to possess over us. Yeah, we're, we're talking some crazy, crazily good humans here. Now the problem, the obvious problem becomes, is it ethical just because humanity will definitely be the better for it? Is it ethical to well, completely override people? Is it humanity that's the better for it, or is it this new race that will become that will replace us. That's true. We that that new race may be genetically different enough, and if it's two percent, it will be genetically different enough to be like Homo sapien instead of Homo sapien sapiens. We'd have Homo, Homo sapien, sapien enlightened sapien us. sapien. <laughs> no, we're not gonna add another sapien on there. Why that means It'll... wisdom. So you just keep adding sapiens, and it's more wisdom. <laughs> Homo sapien 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 genetic. <laughs> That's. <laughs> <laughs> where can we take right. this okay well here's where i'm gonna go from here some people will say oh we can't have that we can't force everyone to do genetic engineering okay that's a good argument you shouldn't force people to do anything freedom of speech freedom of thought all that freedom of action in any case we need to talk about capitalistic genetic babies we're talking about a capitalistic system here. Yes, and so this is this is a lot different. A company who, let's say they co-owned a genetic engineering company, and they also owned an alcohol company, they could sell something to every ba baby that genetically modified. They could tell parents, okay, yes, you're getting all these modifications that makes people perfect humans. But we're also, as an added bonus, we're going to slip in an alcoholism gene, and then they're going to buy our products. Yeah, uh, and the, the issue with that is pretty obvious, you know, um, literally built in advertising, you create consumers, literally creating consumers. And that is creating a problem. At, I mean, at first you think of genetic engineering as something that solves problems, but it's not necessarily true because capitalism desires profit, not simply improving people. So if you if you have a mindset of desiring profit, then you're going to get profit out of it, not get improvements. That's that's true. That's true. And uh, there's also the issue of if you let. This one's pretty simple to explain. If you just let genetic engineering go willy nilly, um, if you let anyone genetically engineer for any reason, but they have to pay for it, like we do in our current capitalistic system, if we don't, if we don't create a government regulated system for genetically engineering babies, then we'll have a system where the rich have all the genetically engineered babies, the poor can't afford genetic engineering for their babies, and we have that class divide we talked about earlier where the rich are literally genetically superior to the poor, and that is very bad for the poor. Because it's difficult to mosey out of that situation. And I think you'd agree with me here. And I'm not just saying that capitalism is bad. Uh, I think I think that even in a socialist system, this would have many, many flaws. And it's something that you definitely cannot just dismiss offhandedly or just ban outright. You need to complete your research. This is this has been, you know, sort of a little uh, a summary of genetic engineering, where it's from, where it's going, where it's at right now. So, uh, in summary, um, well, how how would you how would you summarize this right now? Where I'd say that genetic engineering is kind of a theoretical concept, because even though we've already demonstrated it in other animals and plants. It's still, there's still a frontier, and we have no idea what lies ahead of us. Right, and space I is not the new frontier yet. It's genetic engineering right now. <laughs> I, so I think, I think there's not enough information to adequately say what the future will bring. But there will be a discussion, because the technologies are de being developed right now. That's why this really matters, <laughs> because right now we're going, we're going through huge uh, through huge changes in the genetic modification community. So, I And throughout think... the history of mankind, we've always had changes, but they've mostly been external changes. This is the first change that we're going to have where we actually change ourselves, and it's yeah. it's going to be more huge than, than even the advent of computers or any technology that you can really think of that's happened in your lifetime. Yeah, uh, there may be more that's happening in our lifetime, too. We'll talk about that. 
on future what really matters, hopefully. <laughs> well, maybe it'll be our genetically engineered counterparts that'll be talking about it in the future. Yeah, well, who knows? They'll be the genetically perfect radio hosts with the perfectly smooth voices and right. the best uh, marketing techniques. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, this has been What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew. Goodbye. Goodbye.